Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone out this evening. It's uh, definitely a uh, been a good weather day, I believe. You know, had been kind of warm. God's blessed us today to for the day of life. Let, let's start off with some announcements. Um, Busy Hands will be meeting Thursday in the Fellowship Hall at 6.30. Uh, Seekers will be meeting on the 13th, and that is at uh, Patty and Gary Miller's home at 6.30. And the Builders for Christ will be meeting here on the 23rd on Monday. And um, and then uh, as far as builders go, guys, I'm getting the information together for our... Uh, February school, Builders February school. Um, any other announcements that we need to make? Well, if not, we'll go into our prayer time. Continue to pray for uh, Marvin Cooper, Bobby, and we're glad to see Bobby able to be back here with us. He had his procedure, and Bobby's doing pretty good. And Marvin had his procedure the third time they've had to go in for that, that stone. And so he's uh, doing okay from what Bobby was telling me. So he spoke to him. Uh, continue to pray for Faye and Gordon Edwards. And pray for Ed and Linda and Sarah Tipton, Gail Hall, Kathleen Webb, Donna Peterson. Mandy Neal, Caden and Holden Thomas, Ann Durbin, Penny Bishop, Earl Embry, Greg Tipton, Ruby Wise, the Theta, uh, Theta Rogers family, uh, the Snowden family, the Joy Burkhart family, and the Rhonda Oosley family. Is there someone else you guys would like to mention to add to or to take away from the prayer list? No, uh, Dobbin, Doug Moore family. Anyone else for the prayer list? We'll put uh, Eugene and Linda on here. Anyone else, guys? An unspoken? Okay. Okay. You have an unspoken? Okay. 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 I know that uh, Diana has had a little bit of uh, problems with her e in her ear, so let's pray for her. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I'm going to also add, i got Dorothy Hall, and I'm going to add my wife, Carla Hall, and everything's okay. She's just uh, started having some, uh, like, uh, morning sickness and uh, some pain in her stomach around where they have that, what they call round ligament pain. So she's having a lot of that right now. Anything else, guys? Anyone else? If not... Then I'm going to ask Ricky to start our prayer tonight. We'll have a time of silence, and everyone that wants to pray, you know, 
all the men that would like to speak up and pray, you know, um, uh, just please let me know because we always have one um, who starts our prayer. We have a time of silence, and then we have one that closes in prayer. So if any of you men would like to pray, let me know, okay, aloud. Um, but Ricky can start our prayer. We'll have a time of silence so everybody can pray to themselves. And then I'll ask Michael if he would to finish up our prayer tonight. Okay, let's go ahead and get out our questions from last week's lesson. Uh, we kind of did things a little different. Um, we've been studying on Wednesday evenings, going through the different eras in the Bible, um, like we went through the life of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And uh, then we kind of took a little break, and we talked about some Christmas things like shepherds and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we'll get back on track with our study tonight. But let's start off answering these questions about the real Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. First off, can somebody name a false teaching about Mary? They'll pray through Mary. Co-mediator, that's right. So, co and, and of course, uh, Pepper, he got the other one, co-redeemer. But, of course, Mary's none of these things. She was just a woman of great faith who the Lord used. So people will say that. You can pray through Mary, but you can't. There's only one mediator, Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that plainly. And, of, of course, salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us that. Um, what did Moses do when he was first called to go back to Egypt? He made excuses, that's right, he made one excuse, and then he made another excuse, and then he made a, another excuse, and then you really get to the heart of the matter, because he says, Lord, can you just send someone else? And of course, the Lord sends him anyway. Approximately how old was Jesus in John chapter 2? 30, this will be around the beginning of his ministry. It will be his first miracle, pub, you know, miracle that he would perform publicly at the wedding feast of Cana. What is the first commandment with a promise? Somebody say, it, say that again. Obey your parents and you'll be blessed with a long life. That's right. Where is the first commandment with a promise found in the Bible? Ephesians 6.2, that's right. 
What statement did Mary make that shows she believed in her husband or in her in her son in John chapter two? Do whatever he tells you. Right? And just such confidence in her son. Um, what Bible verse lets us know that Mary never stopped believing in her son? What'd you say? Acts one fourteen. That's right. And that shows, just uh, so you guys know, that shows Mary praying with the early church, Acts 1.14. After Jesus' death on the cross, which disciple took Mary like she was his own mother? John. Fill in the blank. Mary had love that went the, the distance. She went all the way to the cross with Jesus. During his ministry, she would visit him whenever he was a place where she could get to. And, of course, she did whatever she could to take care of Jesus and his disciples. Besides Mary, uh, who else went with Jesus to the wedding feast at Cana? His disciples. Very good. We'll move on from Mary tonight and get back on going through the Bible, through the different people, the different eras, you know, so to speak. And tonight we're on the era of Joseph. And this time frame covers Genesis chapter 37 all the way through Genesis chapter 50. Now Joseph was the son of Jacob, also known as Israel and Rachel. He was the grandson of Isaac and Rebekah. Joseph in the Old Testament really resembles Christ in a lot of ways. So we can look back at Joseph and we can see foreshadowing of Jesus that it, he is to come. You know, a lot of Old Testament pictures of New Testament truths. Like, like take, for instance, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. The disciples were like Jesus' brothers, and one of them betrayed Jesus for 30 silver coins and sold him. And so we see a lot of pictures like that. So tonight we're going to see some important lessons in the life of Joseph and, you know, hopefully just hit the highlights. We won't be able to touch on every single thing, but we're going to hit the highlights. And, and the goal is not to finish Joseph tonight. The goal is to finish Joseph next week and then go on into Moses. Okay? So next week will kind of be a two-part uh, on uh, Joseph and Moses. So the first lesson that I want us to uh, glean from Joseph is that Joseph's life serves as a lesson to parents and Christians on the subject of favoritism. On the subject of favoritism. Now, for those of you who were not in the nativity, who were able to attend Bible study during that time, we spoke on this subject during that time frame. And we saw that showing favoritism toward people is, well, sinful. And for your own personal Bible study, I would encourage you to look up James chapter 2 and read about how it's sinful to show favoritism. I mean, James talks about things like if someone comes into your assembly and he's dressed real nice and you show him favoritism and someone else comes in who's dressed not like that rich person that came in and you don't show them any attention, you're sinning. By showing favoritism. And he talks about stuff like that. And so it's important that we learn this lesson from Joseph because um, it reminds us that when we show favoritism, it causes trouble between families and causes trouble between church family. So Joseph was his father Jacob's favorite son because he was born to him by his favorite wife, Rachel. You see, Jacob had the sister of Rachel, Leah is his wife, and Leah bore him six sons and one daughter. The maidservant, uh, Zilpah, bore him three sons. The maidservant, Bilhah, bore him three sons, and Rachel bore him two sons. That will be Joseph and then Later on, it'll be Benjamin. But Rachel was his favorite wife, and therefore, Joseph was his favorite son. You would think 
that at this point that Jacob would know better. Now, you would think, I mean, think back to Jacob's life. I mean, we just covered it just a few weeks back. Uh, if you remember, in his family, his mother's favorite was him, Jacob, and his father's favorite was his brother Esau, Isaac's favorite. And so we see a lot of trickery, a lot of lying, a lot of deceit, a lot of pain. And basically Esau and Jacob lived their lives as enemies. Two brothers. I mean, it shouldn't be that way, but that's how it was. But Jacob allows this cycle to continue because he shows favoritism to, to Rachel over Leah. And he's really tricked, kind of, kind of tricked into marrying Leah. And then Jacob also gave Joseph this coat of many colors, which kind of stamped, this is my favorite son. And this resulted in his brothers hating him. It resulted in jealousy and his brothers hated him. Now to add a little more to that, God had given Joseph a gift. The gift of being able to interpret dreams. Okay? So Joseph shares his dreams of ruling over his family with his brothers, and so they hate him even more. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis 37. And we'll read about these dreams that Joseph had. God was revealing truths to Joseph in, in dreams and gave him the ability to interpret dreams. And it's very obvious what these dreams meant. Genesis 37, 5 through 11 says, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. Uh, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheave rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. I'm wanting to say, Joseph, hush your mouth, you know. You're going to make them hate you more, you know. But he just tells them. And says, his brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? And they hated him all the more because of the dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing to me. When he told his father, uh, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept this matter in mind. So because of Joseph being this dreamer, and because of this situation with the brothers getting jealous, because of the favoritism, when the brothers get the opportunity, when they're away from their father, when they're out working, they come up with a plan to grab Joseph, to take the coat from him, and to throw him in a cistern, and they do that. But then, some of the brothers, the majority of the brothers, they wanted to kill him because he's this dreamer. But he had two brothers that didn't want to kill him. His brother Reuben and his brother Judah, they didn't want to, to kill him. As a matter of fact, Reuben even came up with a, an idea to try to rescue him. But the other brothers went ahead and sold him to a group of Ishmaelites. Now, if you remember, Ishmael was Abraham's son by the slave girl Hagar. So basically, Joseph was sold to, into slavery to his cousins. I don't know if you'd ever thought of it like that, but that's what happened. And then they, in turn, sold him into slavery in Egypt. And there is a reason we have these events recorded in the Scripture. And one reason is to warn us of the danger of showing favoritism to our children, to our grandchildren, or to our brethren in the Lord's church. It can drive a wedge between people. It can result in people being tempted to do evil things like Joseph's brother. Evil can occur. So I have a discussion question for us 
after talking about this first section, and keep in mind, we still have quite a, more, a quite bit more material to cover. But I've got a question, a discussion question. What precautions can we take as parents and as Christians to prevent showing favoritism? To heed the lessons in the Bible? Yeah. Well, well, this was the answer that I came up with. I sat in my office uh, yesterday and today, and I was really thinking about these questions. And I'll tell you what popped in my mind. The Apostle Paul tells us to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith. It does us all some good from time to time. I say weekly, and the reason I say weekly is because we're supposed to examine ourselves when we partake of the Lord's Supper. So, I say that a preventative method would be to examine our own lives on a regular basis and say, hey, am I showing favoritism? And when we see that, we need to make a change, positive Christian righteous change, right? So examining ourselves as God's people. Doug? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. So consistency is a is a key thing when it comes to parenting. Yeah, um, I, I kind of adopted one philosophy about that when I worked at uh, at the jail in, in Pikeville, and they used to always tell you, and they drilled this into your head: be firm, be fair, be consistent. And so, I mean, if you adopt that into parenting, I mean, you can be firm and fair and consistent. Um, my kids sometimes, I mean, they've said this to me before. They say, oh, Gracie's your favorite, Dad. Yeah, the truth of the matter is, I don't have any favorites. She's just a baby, you know. And so it was also, do you all remember a while back, I did a communion meditation about when I found out that Carla was pregnant with Gracie, and it was at Christmas. And I was talking about how that was just such a wonderful Christmas gift. Well, we went home after that, and all I heard for the next week was, we know what da- whose daddy's favorite Christmas gift was. We know, and, and they were aggravating me. But, but the truth of the matter is, I love them all equal. You know, I die for every one of them, you know. But we have to make sure we tell our kids, hey, I do. I, I love you all just the same. You know, one of you might be a bigger, one of you might be smaller, but you're to love them the same. Any other thoughts, comments on that, on this subject? Right, right, exactly. We shouldn't be like that in church. You know, like I said, James poses that situation. You treat people the same. And the workplace, same thing there. So we'll move on to another lesson in the life of Joseph. And this lesson is Joseph's life serves as a lesson on how to handle temptation. Look back, if you would, to Genesis 37. And go to the very last verse, verse 36. And it says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt, And Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, um, uh, to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. So, while in Egypt, God blessed Joseph in everything that he did. He's a servant serving in Potiphar's household, and Joseph becomes the head slave in Potiphar's household. Household, But, of course, temptation did come just as it comes to us all. We all face temptation of different kinds. Um, and it's important for us to realize that what one person is tempted with isn't what another person is tempted with. You know, different people are tempted with different things. Turn with me over to Genesis 39. So we're moving ahead here in this story of Joseph. And we'll read verses 6 through 10. And it's talking about Potiphar here when it says he. And it says, So he left 
in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. No one is greater in the house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even to be with her. So, of all this... I want us to notice what Joseph said in verse 9. He said, how then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph had this desire in his heart to always do what was right in the eyes of God. And this is how we Christians should think about temptation when it comes our way. We should say, how can I give in to this and do such a wicked thing and sin against God and and I guarantee you if we think like that if we think you know I want to live a life that truly pleases God then that will help us resist temptation but then things go a little bit further look back in Genesis 39 verses 11 through 20 And it says, One day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She called him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had ran out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to him, this Hebrew has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home, that's till Potiphar came home. And then she said, uh, told him this story, that the Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story of of the, uh, excuse me, I lost my place. When the master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, um, Of course, he was blessed. So let's stop right here. Joseph teaches us how to react to temptation. Joseph teaches us to flee from temptation, to remove ourselves from the situation when temptation comes. Okay? Now, like I said, there are a lot of parallels that we can see between Joseph and Jesus. And another one of those parallels is that Jesus teaches us how to deal with temptation. Remember, Jesus, after he's baptized by John in the Jordan, goes out into the wilderness where he eats nothing for 40 days, and then Satan attacks him, right? And when Satan attacks him, what Jesus does is he counterattacks with Scripture, which reminds us that Bible memorization is very important. Because when we quote scriptures that condemn sin, it helps us not to give in to sin. We can counter what Satan throws at us with scripture. And of course, what ultimately happened was Satan fled from Jesus, right? Turn with me over to James chapter 4.
James chapter 4 reminds us of this, and this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, leader in the early church. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and the result is he flees from you. Okay, and so that's exactly what we see Jesus doing. Okay, so what we're seeing here is two methods of how to deal with sin. And I think it's important that we also keep in mind that God always provides a way out of temptation. There's always another choice. Um, Let me give you an example. Okay, there are people today who say, you know, they may be living the homosexual lifestyle, and they make this statement, I was born this way, and I couldn't change at all. What's happened is they've given in to that temptation, and they don't want to change. They've given in to that perversion. Okay, and that's just one example. We can name any sin and put it in there. But please remember, God always provides a way out. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And this is that one of those verses that gets twisted and misquoted a lot. Now, a lot of people will take this verse and they'll say, well, you know, the Lord won't put more on you than you can bear. That is a false statement because sometimes God will put more on you can bear so that you'll lean on Him more, so that you'll trust Him more. But this verse says this, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not be... Uh, He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So it's saying, you can withstand this no matter what comes at you. But when you are tempted, He also provides a way out so that you can stand up under it. Okay? So we're shown two different ways to handle temptation here. Number one, Jesus shows us we counter with Scripture, and the result is Satan flees. Joseph shows us that sometimes we need to remove ourselves from temptation situations. And I've had some guys say this before. I've never had a lady say this before. But I I had a guy say to me before, he said, you know, I I guess I I feel like I've got to stay there and fight. But here's the deal. We've got to remember this that it doesn't mean you're weak if you flee from temptation. It doesn't. As a matter of fact, it means you're strong enough to take the righteous course of action. Since temptation can so easily result in sin, I I brought a couple of pictures on the back of your worksheet for you to look at and for us to talk about here. Um, The first picture, if you see it there, it's it's a picture of a cat. And it's grabbing what it thinks is a mouse's tail. It thinks it's found its dinner. But really, on the other side of that wall is this, like, giant king cobra snake. And and so that reminds us of how it is with sin and temptation. The devil wants to try to make it look good to us. He tries to make it look appealing. I mean, this, this cat here thinks it has a steak, but it's really got a snake, right? And, and so, I mean, that's the way it is with temptation. Satan will not remind you of the consequences of your actions. Instead, he only wants you to see what is appealing, right? And so that, that's one way that Satan works. And I really thought that picture, for me, put it into perspective. Because sin is just as deadly or more deadly than the bite of that king cobra snake. Because sin equals in eternal death in hell, right? Now, the next one is down at the bottom. You see that picture of what's supposed to be Joseph fleeing from Potiphar's wife. And I love this saying. It says, you may be a Samson, in, uh, you may be a, uh, a Solomon in wisdom, or David in praise, or Abraham in faith, or Joshua in war. You know, it's naming all these positive traits. But if you are not a Joseph in discipline, you will end up like Samson in destruction. And isn't that so true? we got to be ready and willing to fight against the temptation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. Bible study and prayer. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, really, it, we have to take it a little bit farther. And, and what I mean by, by that is this. Yeah, we study the Word of God and we memorize certain passages that help us resist temptation. We pray to God. But also something that, that stands out to me is in Ephesians 6, we read about that full armor of God that we have to put on and all that it entails. And, and so I, I was watching this documentary the other day on the Discovery Channel uh, about soldiers. And it was showing soldiers train in their equipment. And, and it's good for us Christians, as Christian soldiers, to train wearing our equipment. To wear that breastplate of righteousness, always doing our best to do what is right in the sight of God. Wearing the belt of truth, surrounding your life with constant truth. And when you do those things, you'll become better at resisting temptation. Any other thoughts? Now, when it comes to uh, Potiphar's reaction, the reality is um, he's the man in charge who has all the soldiers in Egypt under his command. He could have had Joseph killed very easily. And it always shocked me that he didn't. He didn't have Joseph killed. And I, and I pondered this uh, the other day. I was like, you know, why did he not have Joseph killed? But it seems to me, and this is just my opinion, okay? Right here, this is just my opinion. Potiphar may have doubted what his wife said, at least a little bit. And he must have really liked Joseph because he just had him put in prison. He didn't take his life. And of course, God's will plays into that, doesn't it? Why do you think Potiphar looked upon Joseph with so much favor? Because he had done a great job at handling everything that he had. Um, Now, a question that I've been asked before, and I'm sure that you'll encounter people asking you this type question, is why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? You ever have anybody say that to you? And of course, we know as Christians who've studied the Word of God that bad things happen because of sin. And this world is eaten up with sin. But we also see with Joseph that God can take all the good things in our lives that we face and all the bad things and work them together to bring about his perfect will. I mean, who would think that Joseph being thrown into a cistern, his brothers plotting against him, him being sold to his cousins, him being sold uh, to Egypt, would be a good thing? I mean, nobody would think that, right? But it's going to wind up that way when we get to Genesis 50 and verse 20, we see that. And then who would have thought it's a good thing that Joseph is falsely accused of attempted rape. Nobody would think that would be good. He goes to jail. But of course, when he's in jail, God blesses him there. Any questions, comments about what we've said and what we've studied so far? Yep, Romans 8, 28. Yep, that's right. And that, like, that just reminds us of that. He can take the good and the bad and work it. For his perfect will. All right, one more thing I want to uh, point out about Joseph tonight. And like I said, the others will have to wait. But um, Joseph's life serves as a lesson on patience. Now, we don't know exactly how long that Joseph was in Egyptian jail, do we? We we don't know for sure. The Bible doesn't come out and tell us. But I I did some research uh, and... Uh, most scholars agree that Joseph would be in jail for about 13 years, okay? And so, I mean, like I said, that's just, just a guess, but around 13 years. But as with Potiphar, Joseph gained the favor of the prison warden because God's still blessing Joseph. He's in this bad situation, but God is blessing the people to see the good in him. Look back in Genesis 39. 
And let's look at verses 22 through 23. It says, So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. He's in charge of the other prisoners. How often do you think that happens in a jail? A prisoner is put in charge of the other prisoners. It never happens at, at all. Okay? And it says, And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Now, after this, in the course of time, there are two officers, well, I guess I should say uh, two servants who were in uh, Pharaoh's court who are um, ar- you know, arrested and they're put in jail. And those two are the cupbearer of Pharaoh and the baker and they both have dreams and so this gives joseph the opportunity to use this gift that god has given him and so he tells the baker according to his dream that in three days he's going to be beheaded he's going to be put to death but he tells the cupbearer that he would be restored to his position in three days Now, it it makes me wonder what they did. The Bible does not tell us what they did. But it had to be something to do with the drink and the food, right? Maybe they found some poisoned food. And the cupbearer, his whole job was to take a drink of what Pharaoh was going to drink before he drank it, because if it was poisoned, it would kill him, right? And so that was the whole job. We're not sure. But Joseph, he made a request of the cupbearer. And he was asking him to please remember him because he was wrongly put in prison. Go to Genesis 40, 20 through 23. And we read about exactly what happened. And it says, verse 20, Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So it happened exactly how Joseph said. I said beheaded. It said he had him hanged, but you know what I mean. And so he forgot. Joseph did him a good. You know, he told him, you're going to be restored. Could you imagine the anxiety that was lifted off of him? And Joseph was probably thinking, this is my chance. This is my chance. And and the cupbearer forgets all about him. And at that point... Most people would want to give up, wouldn't they? I mean, think about it. Been sold into slavery, been a righteous person, resisted temptation, falsely accused of rape, been in prison for a long time, and you get this opportunity where you could get out if the cupbearer would speak up for you, but then no results. But this shows us Joseph's patience and reminds us of the importance of, of patience because we know what happens with joseph soon he's going to be lifted up to be the second in command of all of egypt but at this point he shows patience you see sometimes we want to force things into our own time frame don't we but when we try to force things to happen during our own time frame that can cause a bunch of trouble can it i mean look back to abraham and sarah They tried it, didn't they? They were both advanced in years, and God had promised them, you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be the son of promise through whom all your descendants will come. But instead of waiting, Sarah says, I have an idea. Abraham, you take Hagar, and you have a child by her. And Abraham agrees, and this causes all kinds of trouble amongst the family. Sarah's jealous, and at one point she wants Hagar and Ishmael 
the son sent away. And she sent away, but they make her come back, and then she gets sent away a second time. But what we have to learn is it's always best to wait on God's will to be done. Turn with me to Lamentations chapter 3. I did that to give everybody a little Bible exercise because we don't go to Lamentations a lot. (laughs) But it says some really good things here about waiting. And of course, this in Lamentations is talking about the Jews waiting for God to deliver them. Lamentations 3, 19 through 26. And it says, I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait on Him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in Him, to the one who seeks Him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Time after time, and I would encourage you to do this, go home and pull up a Google search and type in, Wait on the Lord. Where is it at in the Bible? And when you do that, there's this one website that I always use. It's openbible.com. You can click on that, and you can see hundreds of times in the Bible when we are told to wait on the Lord in Psalm and Proverbs and even in the New Testament. When we're willing to wait on the Lord, it shows that we have trust in God. Now, That's something else the Bible tells us time and time and time again, that we are to trust in God and He will bless us in due time. That's hundreds of times. But when we are not willing to wait on the Lord, we're not showing that we have our faith, our trust, our confidence in Him. So Joseph teaches us about patience because Joseph keeps the faith when it's hard. Someone else in the Bible who came to my mind who had great patience was Job. James talks about the patience of Job. And, I mean, I could only imagine how tremendous. So, here's a discussion question for us. Besides Joseph, can you name someone in the Scriptures who had to wait? And why did they have to wait? Okay, I'll start. Okay, Doug, you start. David, he had to wait. He was anointed, but couldn't become king for multiple years. That's right. And in the meantime, he had, trying Saul's trying to kill him. That's right. So, I mean, that would definitely be very hard. So, David, David did have to wait. Who else had to wait? Yes, yeah, she had to wait a long time, and the Lord answered their prayers. Uh, her and Zechariah. How about Simeon? He had to wait to the end of his life to see, to see the Savior. And then he said, Lord, now you can dismiss your servant. Who else had to wait? How about Ruth? Did she have to wait? She had to wait for her opportunity to show her interest to Boaz. And then she had to wait a while before they could officially be married. Of course, we know Abraham and Sarah had to wait. One that always stands out to me is Jesus had to wait. And what I mean is we talk about how Jesus you know, came to this earth, he was born, he lived for 30 years, and then he started his ministry at the age of 30. When Jesus was 12, he was sitting in the temple courts in Jerusalem talking to the teachers of the law. I mean, and they were amazed at his, his wisdom. So All this time, this 30 years, Jesus had to wait to start his earthly ministry until John the Baptist had prepared the way. 
So even Jesus had to wait. He had to wait for the beginning of time. That's true too. That's true. That's right. Oh yeah, the Bible says that he was slain before the foundation of the world. So even before the world was created, God knew he'd have to send Jesus to save us because he knew we'd mess up. We'd sin. Any others that y'all can think of? With the blood issue? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Right, I kind of get that too. Yeah, at Bethesda. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that, that I I don't know, but it was had to be a long time because he had twelve sons. Well, like I said, next week we'll finish up on Joseph, but I do want to just mention a few things that I want us to take away from the lesson today. I want to encourage you to take away this. Don't show favoritism in any area of your life. Instead, stop and examine yourself. Be sure to examine yourself when you take the Lord's Supper, but sometimes it's also good when you're spending time studying the Word or praying to examine yourself. Also, remember the danger of temptation. and Remember, you can either resist it, and He will flee from you, but there's nothing wrong with fleeing from sin, removing yourself from a situation. And be willing to wait on the Lord. It shows how much faith you have in Him. Like I said, Joseph had to wait somewhere around 13 years in prison, but it was worth it, right? Second in command in all Egypt, and he gets to save his whole family. Okay? So that kind of finishes up our lesson tonight, guys. But of course, I want to remind everyone that the main reason that we're here is the one who's Joseph's life foreshadows, and that's Jesus Christ. We're here because he's our Savior, because we love him, because he was crucified, because he rose from the grave, and because he calls us to be his people. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ wants us all to be saved. He wants us to uh, repent of our sins. He wants us to confess him before man. He wants us to be baptized into Christ. He wants us to live faithfully, and part of living faithfully is continually confessing Christ to the people around us in this world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you tonight, and we thank you that we can study Joseph's life in the Old Testament and that we can be reminded of these important lessons. I pray that we will be people who do wait patiently. I know we're waiting patiently for Jesus to return. And I pray that we'll wait patiently and faithfully. Father, may we be people who put away favoritism. May we be people who put love uh, before other things uh, in our lives, Lord. May we be people who live in obedience, Father, to you. May we resist Satan when he attacks us. May we wear our full armor Father, I pray that you bless each person that's here and those who are worshiping with us online as well. May you be glorified, and we pray this in Christ Jesus' name.